Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 22nd edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. Uh, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who's joining us for the first time. If you've dialed into one of our meetings in the past, you're very welcome back for another edition. Our compliance and disclaimer notice. Uh, for any new people who mightn't have joined us before, uh, just a brief overview of the webinar. So it's going to be an hour long. I generally run these every fortnight. Uh, we have two companies presenting a 30 minutes slot each. The 30 minutes we break down into a 20 minute presentation and then there's 10 minutes open for Q&A at the end. If you do have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. It's just easier for me to moderate and manage the questions if we use the, the Q&A functionality. Uh, please note that the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel. So if a presenter flips over a slide a bit too quickly or you, you miss something, you can go back and watch it on the YouTube channel. It'll probably be up tomorrow uh, along with all the previous meetings are also up on the YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to follow Coffee Microcaps, you can reach us at Twitter at C Microcaps, as I said, YouTube for this recording and recordings of previous webinars, LinkedIn, where I do some additional long form content. And I also have a weekly paid newsletter, which you can get on the Substack platform. So our two presenters this morning, first up, we're going to have Rod Bishop, the CEO or the co-founder and MD of JRide. And then after Rod, we're going to get straight into Cog State with Brad O'Connor. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And Rod, if you can start sharing yours, please, that'd be great. I can see the cover slide of your presentation now, Rod, so you're good to go. Morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name's Rod Bishop, co-founder and managing director of JRide Group. Thanks for taking the time. Look forward to telling you about our company. JRide helps travelers find and book their rides around the world. So we're talking ride hailing companies that you might know, like Lyft, Grab, Kareem, Cabify, 3,700 transport companies and all, anything that you might need in order to get from A to B when you're traveling anywhere on earth, 109 countries, 1,600 airports, again, 3,700 ride companies. And we've been growing that up until COVID at 98% CAGR in six years to December, 2019. This is a, a travel technology stock at an early stage in a long-term growth trajectory. And the position that we will take is to be the traveler's trusted ride brand. So that when, for example, you're in China and you know that Didi is the best ride hail option, but you don't speak Mandarin and how on earth do you access that anyway? You don't really want to download apps. You don't need to do foreign currency exchange in your head. You just want one simple solution that always works for you everywhere on earth in the same style that booking.com always works for your hotels. The position we're building to is that JRide will be the trusted brand that always works for your ride needs wherever you are on earth and regardless of what those needs are. In terms of then how we're positioned, well, we're, we're positioned as a COVID recovery and we're well placed as vaccinations continue to roll out around the world. Uh, the 36% contribution margin shows kind of the, the foundational work that we've been doing to improve our financials. I'd like to take you through that as part of our result. Um, and our recovery is really led by Northern Hemisphere, which I'd like to talk to you about because we're not your typical ASX travel stock. We're very heavily exposed to international markets in a way that others aren't. So as we as we talk about JRide, the you know the, the important thing to notice is that it's a world of opportunity ahead. Um, those are those are bold words. I don't say them just for effect. Obviously, our market has has been to hell. So I'm not going to say it not lightly, but I'm confident to call it because of what we've seen what JRide as a company has done to manage COVID to this point uh, and what we think is ahead. You know, we've controlled the controllable at, since April uh, of last year, significantly reduced costs with $7 million cost out to get through the pandemic without really significant dilutive capital raise. Uh, we've hit significant milestones in terms of continuing to improve our technology platform for better fundamental unit economics to go forward. Uh, and we've become the work of capturing market share in terms of doesn't really matter how big the market is, there's travelers that we can win in this environment and we've got really good positive early signs that we are a larger company in terms of share now uh, and that as that market comes back, we're gonna have retained that into the recovery. 
So this is the year we win the market. Um, we're investing to build a better business. Uh, vaccinations are a fantastic tailwind to us. We're here with the right offer at the right time, uh, having made continuous improvements enhancing well. And I'll take you through all of that today. So first to how JRide you know, runs. The thing that JRide's revenues are driven by is passenger trip bookings around the world. So travelers come, they book ahead of some travel, for a certain number of travelers to travel in a certain destination uh, and then you know some time passes they arrive in destination and they travel uh, does everything go well fantastic j ride recognizes its commission does anything go incorrectly well that's okay we've got the travelers back and the travelers getting a full refund so it's that customer service proposition that drives j rides usage but also the fact that we work everywhere on earth so 109 countries and you can see that broken out on the left hand graph uh, by continent JRide is, is really heavily exposed to international regions. In the 2018 and 2019 years, we built out to 109 countries. And, and now throughout COVID, we find ourselves sourcing and, and serving travelers 90% outside of Australia, 90% in US and UK, which have, of course, really highly advanced vaccination programs. So just to explore that, because it's very different to other ASX travel stocks you'll see. In, in general, uh, you know, an Australian travel brand is going to be sourcing their travelers from Australia and then serving those travelers to you know, international destinations around the world. And that's typically really good business uh, unless the borders are closed to international travel. And then that's you know, impossible. You can't actually do it. Uh, JRide's different. We are sourcing our travelers from the destinations that they're traveling around the world for either domestic or regional travel. So a really good example might be a US traveler that we're sourcing from US, traveling to you know, MCO Airport Orlando, traveling to Cancun, traveling to the Dominican Republic, Budokana Airport, traveling to you know, domestic and regional holiday destinations. We're sourcing that US traveler. We're serving that US traveler in, in a domestic and regional capacity. So we're actually quite insulated from Australia's border policies. We're quite insulated, in fact, from from any region's border policies because we've got such a wide geographic spread. Uh, you can see that in terms of how our trip volume held up across Q1 and Q2. We were really fast out the gate with recovery in Q1 as a result of Europe's recommendations to travel and UK travelers outbound to Western Europe. Uh, obviously, second wave hit Europe, that volume came down, but US volume and Australian volume ticked up. And so we find ourselves you know, in a, in a defensive positioning, really well insulated, but then also in a go forward capacity, really able to target domestic and regional travel wherever vaccination rollout is strongest. So if there's one key message here, it's, you know, while we're really proud of that 98% CAGR over six years, and we're really proud of being 3x up off the bottom uh, from the onset of COVID, you know, the key message is that we're confident in the return to travel somewhere on earth, and especially everywhere on earth over the course of the next 12 months, uh, and there's nothing that I can see that prevents us from accelerating back to that, that previous, you know, growth trend. That trend drives our financials. Key numbers that we always pay attention to, revenue growth. Also, gross profit after paid acquisition is really important to make sure that we're effective after the cost of acquiring travelers. So we, we take out all of our advertising and marketing costs and we present that as a key profit level for investors to watch. And then contribution margin where we take out everything that we consider to be a variable cost, you know, even, even customer service team, things that you know, even only loosely scale with volume, we call it a variable cost and we, and we take that out to make sure that we have a positive contribution. You can see across the latest period, uh, we have grown net revenues, grown gross profit after paid acquisition and critically contribution has returned to positive. It temporarily dipped negative there at the onset of COVID. It's returned to positive. We're generating free cash flows and you know, self-funding the company at least a little uh, even on today's low booking volume. The other thing that's really important, and, and if you go and grab our results deck after this call and take a look, that's actually a record contribution margin, despite the fact that we're sitting here on really repressed volume. It's a record margin of 35%. We've issued a short-term objective of 50% CM margin, uh, just on the basis of our, our confidence around the fundamental improvements that we've made there. This is counterintuitive for a lot of people, right? Our operational gearing in this growth story is coming through at a time when our volumes are depressed, uh, but it just goes to the fundamental work we've done to improve platform and really retain travelers and take care of travelers across the course of this otherwise like very disrupted period. That's a key milestone in the long-term story of JRI. 
So I just want to take a moment to reflect on the 10 years of our business and, and what's ahead. So JRide defines its vision as the traveler's trusted transport brand. And today we serve them at airports, but in general, kind of consider what the traveler's problems are. You know, they don't necessarily speak the language or carry the currency in the destination they're in, right? They don't know what's good. They don't have local knowledge. They want to read reviews they can use. They want a, a platform to recommend to them the best ride so that they don't get, you know, stiffed by a taxi driver or, you know, everyone's had some kind of bad experience. So they get a good experience every single time. You know, a platform today is all about pre-booking and all about airports, but in a future state, that kind of just serves as lead gen to, you know, travelers being in a destination and needing rides anywhere. It doesn't have to be airport and it doesn't have to be significantly pre-planned. You know, from here to that future vision, you know, we're serving a number of passenger trips every time they travel, we're getting their airport transfers, but if we're getting all their rides around town as well, there's significant extra scale that comes with these things. There's significantly improved buying power, pricing power, market power, significantly improved defensibility, and technology will carry us there. In the 10 years to this point, we've been focused on that transport aggregation piece because that vision only works if you're serving every ride that the traveler needs. And it has to be in every country they go to, not just for the traveler, but also for the travel brand. You know, if you're the booking.coms and Expedias of the world and you're going to integrate something like a JRide, you've got to be sure it works for all of your catalog everywhere on earth. You know, when booking.com uses us, they want to make sure that they can attach it to every hotel in every country, not just some. So for, for almost 10 years, our entire business has been focused around that aggregation play, making sure that we're the largest, most comprehensive transport aggregator that exists so that the travel industry and the traveler can be well served. That finished with the completion of our global rollout kind of mid 2019 when you know we, we had essentially a turnkey solution for the traveler that they can use everywhere on earth and we from that point got stuck into making sure that our transaction engine was very profitable it's really these two engines the aggregation engine and the transaction engine if you can be really very effective and very uh, profitable in each of these two engines you've got a great business set up for future scale and here we are in the middle of, you know, you know, depressed volumes as a result of the uh, travel restrictions, having quickly and, and significantly demonstrated that major contribution milestone. It's an important milestone in the life of the company, and it really sets us up for that future scale. So when we talk about what's going to happen next, people are interested in understanding how JRide fits in the COVID recovery story. Obviously, vaccinations are coming. That's going to significantly unlock travel potential. We see three tailwinds, and I'd like to, over the course of just four slides, tell you about them. In general, those three tailwinds are the, the move to online booking of rides, JRide's enhanced competitive position, and then lastly, and of course, importantly, the, the actual event of travel restrictions being lapsed. So let's talk about structural trend first. JRide for 10 years has been bringing transfers from offline to online. In general, travel is, is online booking, right? Uh, on the left-hand side on this uh, graph, you see each travel vertical by their online penetration, number of sales that are made online. You can see flights, accommodation, and even car rentals are almost entirely made online. But when you think about ride service, you know, notwithstanding that you know, different taxi apps exist, in general, it's an offline behavior. You walk up to a taxi rank and you hail it at the curb. Uh, maybe you've got a, you know, a private driver who you know by name and you, you're messaging them on WhatsApp. These are not the typical kind of online comparison and search behaviors that exist for every other travel vertical. JRide's been you know, riding this wave. This whole industry, as, as everything else in travel has gone online, this whole industry is going online. And JRide's been riding that for 10 plus years. And so you know, what happens now with COVID? If anything, it's actually accelerated. Uh, what we've found is we've found that travelers need confidence and that's leading the travel industry to choose to package this more than ever before. So consider, for example, you're a travel brand, an online travel agency like Expedia or Booking or Flight Center, or, you know, these brands we work with, we supply for. You know, previously, your core business being flights and hotels, if someone had have asked you, you know, can you attach a transfer to that, you would have said something like, it's interesting, now, I can clearly make some more money there, but our, our core business is flights and hotels and so we'll you know, we'll focus there for now, we'll get to this eventually. Today, the, the value proposition is different because the, that brand needs to convince the traveler to travel. They need to really step up in terms of traveler confidence and certainty. And we're able to say to those brands, you will sell more flights and hotels if you're able to package this itinerary door to door. As an example of, of that then coming into play, here are some partners who have recently upgraded their implementation with us. 
booking.com, you can see their taxi.booking.com app that's powered in part by JRide. Roam to Rio is a major search engine based out of Melbourne. We're the exclusive supplier of shuttles and private cars into that search engine. Uh, Expedia, you can see here pictured. Expedia is using our ride hailing engine inventory. So on the screen there, you can see Expedia selling Lyft powered by JRide. And it's actually JRide that manages that booking when you book on Expedia. Uh, Shuttle Fair is a US specialist player where we provide supply. Each one of these players has, has really stepped up their transfers game and it's becoming more online than ever before. JRide's competitive position has become enhanced. We're the only online travel aggregator for transfers that's publicly listed. We're the only one that's retained our travelers throughout COVID, retained a great cancellation or refund policy, refunded travelers in full. We're the only one that's retained our product and engineering team to continue to build for scale. Uh, as evidence of this enhanced competitive standing versus those other aggregators, we're the only one that's successfully raised capital throughout COVID with 2.5 million raised in November of last year. And where that leaves us is in this pole position to capture market share. And then lastly, there's the COVID cycle itself. So travel is returning, vaccinations are driving it. Uh, the forecast presented on the left, the blue bars are iata.org, which is a third party source that we reference to, kind of forecasts for what they think 2021 looks like in terms of passenger trips. Around about six to 7 billion passenger trips through airports this calendar year, they're forecasting in terms of recovery towards the end of the year. Uh, the green bars then show JRide because we only rolled out globally a couple of years ago. 2021 accordingly should be one of the largest markets we've ever encountered because we're operating in more countries now than we ever did before. So, so long as that travel recovery continues in the style that IATA forecasts, JRide's got a really amazing trading opportunity across the course of this calendar year. Lastly, just to kind of draw attention to the fact that we're a growth company and investing for growth, I'd like to present our cash flow waterfall. Uh, this is available, uh, as I'll fly through it here, in our results presentation, and I encourage you to go and take a look, including all the financials. Uh, a few things to draw attention to here. In general, in terms of receipts, you know, we're propped up by grants and subsidies a little bit at the moment, but we're also returned to positive cash flows in terms of our contribution from our bookings and in terms of our, our free cash uh, that we generate when people pre-book, we carry the float. And over the course of the half, that was actually larger income than our uh, operating costs here pictured. Uh, 1.2 million give or take of total receipts versus 1.1 million of operating costs. Uh, in, in terms of how to think about that going forward, obviously grants will will retain some grants. For example, we are eligible for R&D tax incentive. Uh, grants will dial down a little bit, of course, contribution from trips and the, the rebuilding of that cash flow that, that'll continue to step up over the course of the coming year. And so we'd expect to try to retain that uh, you know, positive operating cash flow across that part of our operating business. Then we're investing for growth and you can see the capital raise here and selective investments that we're making to drive future operating performance uh, in terms of, for example, engineering, product and technology, the, uh, you know, the applications that we build. So we've continued to invest across the period and that's an investment that we're going to continue. Obviously, we've got lots of good dry powder with our closing cash balance to continue to get stuck into to building that future earnings. So in summary, uh, JRide's half, we were impacted by passenger trips, uh, you know, being down as a result of the pandemic, but that initial recovery continues since April and it's, it's ticking up around the world. Uh, we actually reduced, although it's counterintuitive, our cash burn, we improved our cash operating performance by 54% versus PCP pre-COVID, uh, and our contribution margin has returned positive, and I said again, it's record at 36, with line, line of sight even to 50% margin. So we've proven our unit economics, it's a major, uh, major milestone in the life of the company that we've cracked there. So when we look forward, obviously we're well positioned to benefit from vaccinations. Uh, we're very insulated, we're not affected so much by Australia's border policy because we're more able to trade across US and EU regions than almost any other Australian travel story. There are those three recovery drivers. You've got the, the most important ones being that structural trend to online and our improved competitive position versus other incumbents in the industry. So we're in pole position to, to win new market share, whether that's by bringing new travel or bookings online for the first time, or else just capturing relationships in a, an otherwise distressed online market. Thank you very much for your time. Um, that was uh, my presentation. I'll, I'll leave this slide and I'd like to open the floor for questions. Thanks, Rod. Uh, we've got uh, 
one quickly now from the audience, and I've got one or two that were emailed in ahead of time. Um, is J-Ride a white label solution? Or are you building a brand in travel? Yeah, it's a good question, Shane. So today, J-Ride's revenue is a mix of both B2B and B2C. We see ourselves very similar in terms of stage as to where booking.com was at the stage of their growth story. So travel brands can implement J-Ride's API, and then they can use that to turnkey the entire world of travel. Uh, for transfers and example brands that we work with booking.com Expedia flight center you know t large travel management companies uh, large member brands for example NRMA uh, large search engines for example Rome to Rio anyone who really wants to add transfers to their application they can do simply by parking and playing our API and, and pre-COVID that was about half our business uh, and then the other opportunity long term is to build this direct to traveler and you can see that at the jride.com website uh, you can access it on your mobile it's a beautiful experience long term these two things really complement each other so and again to, to, to give reference to the booking.com story you know in the early days booking.com you know they'd give their hotel inventory to anybody who asked and then as they got more buying power and a little bit more market power they were able to enforce on the basis that their catalog was best that if you were going to use it you had to mention their brand uh, which means that it doesn't matter if you're you know Qantas selling a booking.com hotel you've got to mention that that hotel is coming from booking.com because booking wants the opportunity to retain you long term to be a direct customer and that's how we see these two channels working together long term every one of those B2B, uh, you know partners that we've got uh, it becomes an opportunity to feed the funnel full of travelers that we get to retain directly and so they work they work hand in hand they're very complementary Thanks, Rod. If I can just do the questions now um, before any more come in from the audience. Um, again, it's around partnerships. It says you have, uh, you know, the partnerships at booking.com more on the consumer facing side, but do you have partnerships with, you know, like a corporate travel management or an American Express global travel on the for the corporate business? Yeah, absolutely. So we work with uh, Australia's leading corporate travel brands. Um, so example, uh, you know, Flight Centre, uh, we get a lot of corporate business out of Flight Centre's corporate travel brands uh, and others too. Um, you know, any brand that you'd expect to want to be offering transfers to their audience, uh, these, are our, these are our clients. Um, I, I don't have the slide handy in this presentation, but in the appendix of our results deck, uh, we do have we do present the logo wall of, of all of those logos. Um, there's, oh, I don't know, from memory, 50, 60 odd there that we present that kind of gives you a flavor of the brands that we work with and we provide transfers with. And then a question then just on uh, foreign exchange, you know, a, a strong Aussie dollar is, is a negative for you. And I guess what, what do you do on in terms of hedging that? given where it's kind of been going over the last uh, three to six months? It's interesting. It's it's not a very significant problem. Um, so just to explain first where the uh, how the bookings work, because that's, that's pretty critical. If a transport company needs to be paid in USD, uh, we transact the traveler's credit card or invoice for that booking in USD. So we don't wear any exchange risk in the, in the, the actual transaction of the booking. Uh, and then with regards to our, our cost base and our non-variable costs, uh, that tends to be split between AU and USD anyway. So as an example, um, you know, our, our Ukrainian engineer, um, you know, our, our Philippine customer service team member, you know, these sorts of people are not always necessarily denominated in AUD. Uh, and so it, that kind of uh, insulation in the booking flow and then the mix of, uh, mix of currencies in our cost base, uh, we don't tend to need to look so hard at, at foreign exchange movement. Right. There were there are two questions ahead of time. Um, I'll throw it back open to the audience if we have any more questions from the audience. I'll give it a minute here. Uh, Rod, if you don't mind, just while, while we're waiting quickly, can you just go to, the, I think it's the last slide in your presentation on um, where people can get in touch with you if they, uh, yeah, that's it there. So if, if anybody wants more information to find uh, investor relations, corporate at jride.com. Okay, I don't think we've got any more. We're finishing up a, a bit early, but uh, I see Brad is uh, patiently standing by in, a, in any event. 
Um, Rod, thank you very much for the present. Oh, oh, sorry, one came in there just as I think. Uh, oh. In terms of cash needs, um, do you think you need to, to raise more or between, I, I think, yeah, you, you've kind of answered that already in terms of, um, but maybe just kind of go back over this slide again. Yeah, no, no, it's a good question. No, uh, so the in October, November last year, we put together two and a half million, which is ample to see ourselves through, you know, even kind of bearish case scenarios around the, the timeline of COVID recovery. <coughs> Forgive me. Um, and indeed, even to invest incrementally more in capturing market share. And so that capital raise was very well supported. Uh, and we have, as a result of that capital raise, stepped up some of our costs. And you can see here how that encapsulates. Uh, especially in uh, business development and product and engineering to build those integrations into those kind of demand side sales channels like the Expedias and bookings. Uh, you know, that capturing of market share then showing really, really interesting, really positive initial signs uh, as a result of that increased expenditure. So uh, no, no, robustly insulated uh, from, you know, ongoing pandemic and indeed incrementally deploying to win more business and retain that business into the recovery. Uh, by the numbers uh, there, the available liquidity at the bottom of the slide, uh, 2.3 million cash at 30 December, uh, trade and other receivables, uh, still further grants expected. These are the these are the known ones. I think, you know, there's, there's definitely an opportunity here that the federal government will also do something else for the travel industry to the extent that they're going to, that's excluded from these numbers. We don't have the, the full size and scope of that yet. Uh, and then some debt headroom if we ever did need it. Uh, so no, feeling feeling robustly insulated and just really getting stuck into capturing market share. Very great. Thanks for going back over that again, Rod. I think we we will leave it there this time, and I'll uh, hand over to Brad. So Rod, if you can just please stop sharing your screen, and then we'll. Get Thank you, there. everyone, and uh, look forward to staying in touch. Brad, if you can. Start sharing your yeah, screen. I will let you know once I'm coming up. Uh, just, yeah, I can see the cover slide now, Brad, so you're good to go. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. My name is Brad O'Connor. I'm the CEO of Cogstate. Um, during today's presentation, I'll take you through our first half 21 results, as well as our outlook for the second half of 21 and beyond. We'll then have some time um, at the conclusion to take some questions. Um, before we get started, just want to remind everyone that Cogstate reports in US dollars. Um, so all the figures quoted today will be US dollars. Um, I note that this presentation includes forward-looking statements and no doubt disclaimer. Uh, so getting into it, I want to start today by outlining the investment case for Cogstate. Firstly, Cogstate has a record revenue pipeline of almost $75 million US at 31 December 2020 with a stable cost space that will deliver earnings leverage into the future. Momentum continues to build in our clinical trials segment with continuing good levels of sales contracts and the resulting revenue backlog in that segment has increased to almost $50 million. In addition, in our healthcare segment, a newly executed global license agreement with international pharmaceutical company ASI will produce minimum royalties of $10 million over the next five years that's in addition to the $15 million royalty payment that we received from them in December 2020. Further minimum royalties of another $20 million will roll off over years six to 10 of that license agreement. A stable cost base will see margins expand as revenue increase in coming periods. Secondly, Cogstate has significant leverage to an Alzheimer's treatment. There's a number of potential treatments with a short-term path to regulatory approval and then subsequent product launch. Our recently announced partnership with ASI means that Cogstate is uniquely placed to provide highly scalable digital tools for early identification of patients suffering from cognitive impairment that might be associated with early Alzheimer's disease. Thirdly, Cogstate is a unique technology focused on large addressable markets. Cogstate technology has over 20 years of scientific validation and those digital solutions are perfect for large global market where there's a growing demand for telehealth and mHealth style self-assessments. Cogstate has forced substantial change, changes to the healthcare systems globally. The rise of telehealth and mHealth style assessments has been substantial and we believe 
that these are permanent changes and the Cogstate technology solutions are well designed for a virtual assessment paradigm. Finally, possibly for the first time in our history, Cogstate business plans are underpinned by a strong balance sheet. During today's presentation, I'll explore each of these in more detail. Since look, first launching our technology and clinical trials market in 2004, the majority of Cogstate's revenue has come from the clinical trials business segment, where our customers are pharmaceutical companies seeking to determine the impact of their investigational drug that that, that, that may have on cognition. Clinical trials is our established business and that generated $21 million of revenue in fiscal year 20. Healthcare, the use of our cog state technology to measure brain health in the community is our next horizon. It was the basis of our original investment proposition and it's starting to become a reality as we get closer to the release of a disease modifying therapy for Alzheimer's disease. This is a, a subscription-based software revenue model sold through strategic partners such as ASI, who have other revenue. And in this case, that revenue is from the sale of therapeutics and, that, and the adoption of those therapeutics is tied to the use of Cogstate software. In both of these segments, Cogstate relies on data and more than 600 peer-reviewed publications that come from decades of collaboration between academic research and the Cogstate science team. So our vision is, to, is for Cogstate to replace manual burdensome and difficult assessments of cognition with scalable digital solutions that, can, that can be performed routinely. Cogstate solutions are perfectly suited to a world adopting telehealth and mHealth solutions. In the wake of the COVID pandemic, we've seen a substantial shift in the way individuals access healthcare. And we believe that that's a permanent change in Cogstate's position to leverage from that change. There's three really key messages for today's presentation. We've executed that landmark license agreement uh, with the international pharmaceutical company, ASI and that provides Cogstate with $45 million US for minimum royalties over the 10 year license period. And then um, the opportunity for significant upside from the potential near term launch of the first Alzheimer's therapeutic. The size of the addressable market in four key markets alone is more than 320 million people. So this big market. Our clinical trials business continues to strengthen. Sales have been excellent in the context of the pandemic. Our revenue in this segment was a little sluggish through the first half of fiscal 21, but still up 52% compared to PCP. Contracted future revenue that will roll off over time is now close to $50 million, which is an all time high. Cogstate's well positioned to show profit growth in the coming periods. Forecast revenue growth in both clinical trials and healthcare segments, supported by a revenue, uh, record revenue backlog, provides confidence of that revenue growth. Within the context of that revenue growth, the cost control that we're um, placing within the business provides confidence of profit growth. So I wanna talk a bit about this um, agreement with ASI. Um, in October, 2020, we announced the partnership um, and that takes us an important step closer to realizing our vision of cognitive assessment performed routinely as part of periodic health assessments. ASI are a global pharmaceutical company. They pioneered the treatment of Alzheimer's disease with the launch of the widely adopted Alzheimer's symptomatic treatment, Aricept, in 1997. ASI are global leaders in, in Alzheimer's disease with a focus on the development of a dementia care ecosystem. And that extends from all the way from identification of memory impairment through to intervention with therapeutics. They've partnered with Cogstate because they are scientifically validated digital assessments are really well suited to use as a screening tool in multiple settings, including home-based self-assessment, so a direct-to-consumer product, a provision of assessments to primary care physicians or general practitioners, specialist-based assessment, and then once somebody is on therapy, ongoing monitoring of the cognition of that patient on therapy. Presently, the commercial opportunities focus on the increased awareness of the importance of brain health, and that exists at the moment. There's a market for better and easier assessment of brain health today with a focus on lifestyle changes that have been shown to improve cognition. But the potential future opportunity relates to the launch of a disease modifying therapy in Alzheimer's disease. In that situation, the commercial opportunity centers around the identifications of patients who would benefit from such treatment and ongoing monitoring of those patients. 
The release of a disease-modifying therapy for Alzheimer's disease will require the early detection of cognitive decline in order to intervene and slow progression of the terrible disease. The global market for digital screening tools that, is, that are both scalable and sensitive to change associated with Alzheimer's disease is really large. To get a sense of how large the addressable market is in the four key markets that have been identified under the agreement with ASI, those markets being the US, EU, China and Japan, we looked at the number of people over the age of 65 in those markets. I do want to point out here that this isn't a product solely focused on people over the age of 65. There's a reality that that's a little bit easy to get those numbers um, than it is to get people over the age of 45 or 50. Anyway, it gives a sense of market size. So taking those numbers alone, that represents an addressable market of over 320 million people. And it's important to note here that there's a potential for multiple assessments each year in some of those individuals. Those people who are where we're seeing change, it's likely they'll be assessed multiple times per year. So it's a really large market. And we've never been closer to the potential launch of an Alzheimer's disease therapeutic. ASI, along with their development partner Biogen, have submitted application for approval to the regulators in the US, the EU and Japan for their drug that's called aducanumab. A decision in respect of the US approval is expected from the FDA no later than the 7th of June this year. Other potential therapies, including another one from ASI Biogen, uh, one from Roche Genentech and one from Eli Lilly, are all in development with pr promising data released from uh, prior studies already. Um, so we're really close um, to this. And co at Cogstate, we feel very confident that even if it's not aducanumab that's approved this year, we are getting very close to an approval. And we expect some one of these drugs to be approved in the next uh, 18 to 24 months. I'll look now at the specifics of the agreement with ASI. In October, we executed a global agreement that expands upon the agreement with that was entered into by the two parties in respect of Japan um, in, uh, about a year earlier. Since execution of the Japan license, ASI have proven to be a really supportive partner that's committed to building an entire ecosystem for dementia patients and their families. With solutions targeting everything from identification of the first signs of memory loss to the development of therapeutic treatments, as well as a range of lifestyle factors in between. Under the terms of the license, ASI will be responsible for marketing Cogstate technology in all countries, including all existing technology and future improvements to Cogstate technology. The agreement will exclude the clinical trials market where Cogstate will continue to offer our technology and services independently. The global license has a term of 10 years on a country by country basis from the date of commercial launch in each of those countries. ASI have committed to launch within the US inside one year of agreement, so by October of 2021, uh, within the EU within three years and China within four years. We actually expect that the launch will happen uh, well inside those dates, but they're, they're the contracted obligations. ASI will have the option to terminate the agreement up after five years under certain specific circumstances. Under the license, ASI will pay Cogstate minimum royalties totaling $45 million across the 10 years, including a $15 million upfront license fee and $30 million of minimum royalties. The minimum royalties will increase from year to year and total 10 million for periods one to five, and then another $20 million from year six to 10. Similar to the agreement in respect of Japan, ASI have agreed to fund any software development work required to further develop, improve or alter the product the Cogstate product that is, for use within each country. ASI will also manage and pay for regulatory um, issues and a regulatory engagement, and they'll be responsible and will pay for all sales and marketing activities. The resulting data from the use of the technology will be jointly owned by ASI and Cogstate. So we believe this is a really strong commercial agreement for Cogstate. I want to spend some, a few minutes now to talk about the treatment of the revenue under the ASI agreements. I'll focus on the most recent global agreement, which excludes Japan, which is obviously the larger of the agreements. The revenue under the global agreement can be broken down into three segments. The upfront royalty of $50 million, which was received by Cogstate in December 2020. 
the minimum royalties for the ten million dollars payable over the next five years, and the minimum royalties payable over years six to ten of twenty million dollars. The upfront royalty plus the minimum royalties from years one to five, so that amount totals $25 million, will be amortised over the first five commercial years of the agreement. Commercial year one will begin upon the first sale and that must occur within, within one year of contract execution. Therefore, the amortisation period has been set as six years from contract execution. This equates to minimum revenues under the global agreement of a little bit over $4 million per financial year. On a pro rata basis, minimum license fee revenue from the global agreement will be $2.84 million in fiscal 21. The minimum royalties for years six to 10 have been ignored at this stage because of ASI's right to terminate at the end of year five. Should that right be voided by other commercial events, then at that stage, the additional 20 million of minimum royalties will need to be accounted for. It's important to note that the accounting treatment and revenue recognition will differ from cash receipts. The cash receipts of the 15 million upfront royalty has already occurred in the first half of fiscal 21, whereas the revenue recognised um, in, fiscal, in the first half of fiscal 21 was only $780,000, which was the amortisation of that revenue from the period of execution, 26th of October, 2020, to the end of the period being 31 December. It's important to note also that due to the significance of the global license agreement, the, as a group, we reviewed the application of the accounting policy in respect of revenue relating to the grant of licenses, provision of supporting services, and the provision of server access in accordance with the requirements of the accounting standard AASB 15. And that's resulted in a change to the application of our previous uh, revenue policy. In the prior period, Cogstate recognised an upfront $1 million payment that was received from ASI in respect of the licence to the Japan region. Cogstate considers that recognising the upfront payment as revenue on a straight line basis over the licence rather uh, better reflects its performance um, obligations providing access um, to the Cogstate software over that period of time. So as required by the accounting standards, this change has been applied retrospectively. As a result, we've restated the comparative revenue figures um, in the healthcare segment. So just to put that in context there, it's a $1 million uh, payment that in the prior comparative period was recognised as revenue. We've restated our policy um, and restated those accounts so that that $1 million is now spread over the 10 year life um, of that agreement. I wanna switch gears now to look at the clinical trial segment. And we note that the core business is strengthening there. The first half result was strong and followed a very successful sales period um, in fiscal 20. Those sales have delivered revenue backlog of almost $50 million US as at 31 December. And that provides really great confidence in respect to the revenue growth in the coming periods. As a reaction to the COVID pandemic, Cogstate's established innovative partnerships with multiple pharma companies to utilize our digital assessments for remote assessment in clinical trials. And we see this as a permanent shift in the industry and, the, and it's a shift that Cogstate can benefit from. We continue to pursue our channel partnerships as a way of increasing market share. Uh, we entered into an agreement with a large company called ERT, and that's delivered multiple sales opportunities. And we're aiming to finalise the first of the joint contract wins in the coming weeks. Uh, over the last 18 months, Cogstate has broadened our reach into clinical trials across a range of indications. There's momentum in Alzheimer's disease R&D presently on the back of the positive data, such as Eli Lilly's recent um, announcement um, in respect of their phase two study and I note that Cogstate perform, um, managed all the cognitive endpoints in that study. But also Cogstate is supporting trials and growing business across a range of indications. However, we've got to be conscious of the potential disruption um, caused by COVID. But like Rod before me, falling case numbers, increasing rate of vaccination in the Northern Hemisphere really gives us hope that the second half of um, Financial 21 will see will not see the same sort of revenue interruptions that we saw in the first half um, of the financial year. I want to now turn to have a look at the financial results in a little bit more detail. Um, I won't belabor the point here though. 
Um, overall, we saw strong revenue growth compared to PCP in the clinical trials. As I noted before, we know the PCP in healthcare segment has been restated. EBITDA uh, for the period was a profit of $700,000 for the six months. And that was an improvement of $3.6 million on PCP. Also note that the loss before tax of $360,000, so a small loss before tax, but that is inclusive of one-off costs of about half a million dollars that were related to uh, executing the ASI Global Agreement. Importantly, I note that the operating cash inflow during the half year to 31 December was $13.2 million US. And obviously that was boosted by the payment from ASI. I want to focus a little bit on our contracted revenue backlog. I've mentioned that a couple of times now. Um, that contracted revenue backlog provides really good insight into revenue growth in coming periods. Um, that $75 million will roll off in future periods. And that's the, the amount, the, that $75 million, is an increase of 96% um, compared to the prior, the same amount of the prior period. And of that $75 million, $12.2 million is expected to be recognised in the second half of Financial 21. But probably just as importantly as that, when we look six months out to the beginning of Financial Year 22, we can see that COG states already secured over $20 million US of revenue for that period. We'll continue to add to that as we, um, as we sign sales agreements um, for the period 1 January through to 30 June. So really confident of starting fiscal 22 with a record level of contracted, secured, guaranteed uh, revenue falling into fiscal 22. So to summarise our financial outlook, the clinical trials business is really well positioned to show revenue growth in the second half, um, with over 10 million of contracted revenue expected to roll off in that segment. Sales expectations for the second half of 21 are supported by Cogstate remote assessment capabilities, our sales channel partnerships and our strategic customer relationships. Finally, we're cautiously optimistic that the site-based activities in clinical trials, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, will be less impacted by um, COVID during the second half of the year. In the healthcare segment, we're already seeing substantial commercial activity in Japan and pre-launch activity by ASI in the USA and in Asian markets. In the second half of 21, healthcare revenue will increase with a six-month contribution under the ASI Global Licence Agreement. Overall, we're targeting a profit before tax for the full fiscal 21 year, with only the potential COVID interruption tempering our expectations by providing some degree of uncertainty. So in conclusion, uh, Cogstate has a record revenue pipeline of almost $75 million at the 31st of December with a stable cost base and that will deliver earnings leverage. We remain excited about the prospect of a potential approval of an Alzheimer's thera therapeutic to which Cogstate has significant leverage. We've got unique technology focused on large addressable markets where our digital solutions can leverage the growing demand for telehealth and mHealth style assessments. So we're well positioned in terms of what's happening globally. And then finally, as I said before, the first time in our history, Cogstate business plans are underpinned by a really strong balance sheet. Um, I'll thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Brad. Um, yeah, two questions, I think probably from a long-term shareholder, just given the nature of them. Um, it was very encouraging to see the number of NOAU adopters in Japan. Has ASI started generating revenue? How is the trend toward reaching a profit that COG State can share in this, the first question? Yeah, um, so it's a good question. So for those who aren't as familiar with, uh, with what's happening in Japan, so ASI have launched um, a direct-to-consumer website. Um, it's called Nono, um, N-O-U-K-N-O-W. Um, and uh, they, they launched that product uh, incorporating Cogstate technology, direct-to-consumers, so that people can measure their own cognition. Um, they've been selling that to partners, including to corporates. So yes, they are generating revenue um, from that. You, people will um, appreciate that there's a lot of spend up front um, that's going into um, 
uh, marketing the CogState technology. So that our, our deal terms there is that in Japan market, CogState shares 50-50 um, in the profit of that business. That's quite different to the global agreement where CogState takes a royalty on every sale. So that that profit share is only in Japan. Um, so what we're seeing at the moment is the spend that's going on um, is very significant in Japan, um, in Japan and, um, and the spend is significant globally as well. So we're probably some time away from profit share um, out of the Japan region. Grand and then, but we like that, to be honest, because we, we want them spending and generating that kind of activity at this starting point. Yeah. Um, Cog said spent about 660K developing the ISLT smartphone app this half year. Uh, how much mm -hmm. of that can you get reimbursed by? I'm not sure what ADDF stands for. And where are yep. you in terms yep. of uh, commercialization of the app? Yep, good question. So the ADDF is the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. Cogstate received a $1.3 million grant from them last year. Uh, that grant is supported by uh, the Gates Foundation um, and their push for digital uh, biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so essentially 100% um, of that investment to date will be supported um, by that uh, Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation grant. At, at, how that's accounted for at the moment, if you have a look at our balance sheet, you'll see those grant funds are actually recorded as a liability um, at the moment. So that, that will, as, when we get to release of the product, that liability will be extinguished um, and they'll have to flow through our P&L. Um, the, the product itself is going really well. So we're, um, we're in final um, bug testing um, of that product. Uh, and we're hopeful, certainly we'll have product on market in, um, in calendar 21, and we're hopeful of uh, getting product at least through piling stage uh, within fiscal 21, so by 30 June. Okay, and then another one. Um, are you able to share the size of the first joint contract with ERT? Uh, I, so it's not secured yet, um, and no, I, 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 uh, we won't be sharing uh, the size of that. There's a number of different um, opportunities we're pursuing at the moment. Um, and I think um, uh, it, it can be misleading to focus on the size of, of that joint contract, um, to think that that is in some way indicative that every contract will be that size. And so I, I don't want us to uh, get distracted by that. I think the more important factor is that um, you know, ERT is a large supplier um, in the clinical trial services industry, um, you know, really large market share, certainly in excess, in excess of 50% um, market share. They have 120 business development um, executives you know, in comparison to Cog State, three business development executives. So um, really large um, sales and marketing team. Uh, so the opportunity here is for really, and we've, embedded Cogstate technology within the ERT system. Um, and we believe that this is a really important potential sales channel for us. So the important aspect here is just the their level of engagement and the winning of work. Um, I think that's more important than what is the value of the first contract. Um, but we will announce um, uh, when we've secured um, that first win, but we'll probably stay silent on the value of that. Okay. And then um, you mentioned on this slide, the uh, FDA review is due in June, um, and I know mm. myself, the FDA, they're very, one thing they are good at is the structure nature of, you know, it's 90 days from this or, you know, 120 days from yes. this. Um, where are you with Japan and the EU? Do they have similar structure timelines or, or is it a bit more, um, you're kind of waiting for them to come back to you kind of thing? Yeah, so I, I don't. I certainly don't have um, as much visibility in, rela in re relation to the timelines um, in Japan and the EU from a regulatory approval um, perspective. I know that submission has been, um, yeah, so the, the, the license application has been submitted. Um, our expectation is that decision will be made in the US um, in advance of either Japan or the EU. So we think that they'll wait and see, um, you know, take some guidance from the decision in, in the US. Um, but I can't be more specific than that at the moment. Okay, great. I think that probably answers our other question. 
them as well. Uh, I'll leave it now for another minute. If we've got any any further questions for Brad before we before we let him go. No, that doesn't look like it, uh, Brad. I think we we'll, we we'll leave it there. We're approaching um, ten a.m. as we speak. Brad, thank you much. Thank you so much for your time this morning. And uh, yeah, if anybody wants to get in touch with Brad, his uh, contact details are on the screen there in front of you. Thank you very much, Mark. Appreciate your time, everyone. Cheers. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you next week for another installment of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. Thank you. <laughs>